Welcome to episode 27 of Storm the Norm, the fortnightly podcast where we pick up norms that come in the way of businesses succeeding in a disruptive world. I am Narayan. And I'm Anisha Motwani. Storm the Norm is brought to you in association with Grand Content Bharat. On to today's episode now. Anisha, I have a question for you to begin with. Mm-hmm. What connects a samurai, a woodcutter, a bandit, and the samurai's wife with blockchain? <laughs> I never thought I'd see those words strung together in the same sentence, Narayan. So I have no clue. Are you pulling a fast one on me? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, but I highly doubt even Akira Kurosawa would have ever thought those words would be strung together in the same sentence either. So firstly, my apologies to the great master and to you and to any of his fans for the sacrilege. But I hope he... And they would appreciate the reference once I explain it. I'm all ears, Narayan. So those four characters I mentioned, the samurai, mm-hmm. the woodcutter, bandit, and the samurai's wife, are the instruments Kurosawa used to explore the nature of truth itself in the 1950 classic Rashomon. Yes. Not a Bengali movie, Japanese <laughs> movie. <laughs> it was um, one of the earliest cinematic explorations of this nature. And to this day, it remains a benchmark after which the Rashomon effect is also named. But what it revealed about the truth is that it is dependent on the experience and perspective of the people involved in it, directly or indirectly. But isn't truth objective, Narayan? I think you just proved Kurosawa's point by even allowing the question, Anisha. But we'll save that debate for another day. The reason I bring out the Rashomon effect today is it's probably applicable to the norm at hand, the one that we want to storm today. And that norm is this. Human trust can never be replaced by algorithmic trust. I see the connection to blockchain in your original sentence now. Truth and trust. Uh, But I'm still intrigued even more by the Rashomon effect and its place in this norm. So, Anisha, let me elaborate. My thinking is that trust, like truth, is a highly subjective phenomenon based entirely on human experience and perspective, both individual and collective. With you so far? So, if that's the case, then how can an algorithm, a structured set of instructions encoded to enable repeatable tasks with the same consistent result every time, How can an algorithm create or replace a phenomenon like trust, which, to bring it back to Rashomon, differs for the samurai, for his wife, for the woodcutter, and for the bandit? When you put it like that, it does seem like an impossibility, isn't it? Okay, so let me break this down a little bit. Let's break trust down a little bit more, shall we? Mm -hmm. Subjectivity is just one dimension of trust as we know it. You know, one's currently held beliefs play a large part in how one approaches an object of trust. A second dimension is the fragility of trust. It can be broken by something that may not necessarily be a disastrously bad mistake or error of judgment also. Agreed. And a third dimension is that it takes time to build trust. It's not something that can be generated instantly, not even overnight. For the most part, yes. And yet, I know I've been talking a lot, I'll try to wrap this up here. And yet, there is also a similarity inherent in trust and algorithms. Trust functions as a reliable shortcut for decision making. It's a must have in the toolkit of classical system one thinking as uh, Kahneman put it, or in heuristic decisions. Because as humans, we look to simplify decision making as much as possible all the time. So trust, The fact that something or someone will always meet our expectations of reliability plays that part really well, which is also precisely the outcome that algorithms deliver, the same result reliably every single time. So are you saying that human trust, in fact, can be replaced by algorithmic trust, Narayan? I think I'm open to the idea, even though my first rule of understanding the world is that people are irrational, inconsistent creatures. I believe that too, Narayan. But I'm also quite excited by the fact that algorithms, blockchain to be more specific, can in fact help us fragile, irrational creatures by taking the fragility, subjectivity and time humans take to build trust and putting the repeatability and scalability of technology to deliver the outcomes of trust. Reliability, consistency and transparency. So the 
earlier days the trust equation we used to say the trust is equal to credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided mm. by self orientation technology can actually replace credibility and reliability but there are two human aspects of trust which is intimacy and self orientation okay mm. which is something which technology will find it difficult to replace and yet we have an a norm here uh, which is exactly challenging can human trust be replaced by algorithmic trust actually the, the first two dimensions that you spoke about that's why i'm willing to step into this world anisha even if with a little trepidation i i guess i'm a little old fashioned about this norm also because i find the rationality and subjectivity of human experience to be one of the most exciting things to study mm-hmm. and i wonder if taking these out of the equation will render us boring and predictable well i believe we have just the right person to allay some of your fears at least narayan our guest expert today comes from the perspective that one of the main reasons the realm of blockchain and crypto and web 3.0 has felt a little obscure and complex to most people is because it has been too technical and even boring for most people he believes that making it entertaining is critical to making it mainstream now that i'm willing to listen to that anisha well then without further ado let me introduce our expert today jonathan karas is a technologist crypto trader blockchain and token economic specialist futurist shakespearean actor magician and drone pilot he is also founder of livana protocol a company focusing on leveraging the power of defi or decentralized finance for the uninitiated jonathan it's an absolute pleasure to have you here on this episode of storm the knob thank you yeah thank you for having me on today So thank you Jonathan uh, let's dive straight in and start with the central premise and pun unintended here of web 3.0 including with a specific use case such as defi which is where you specialize is control truly being decentralized or is it actually being re-centralized from one set of limited hands to a different set but still not in the hands of many That's a great question and I think that there's a few different stages to what is being enabled here within the uh, crypto landscape and and the decentralized finance movement and I don't say the word movement lightly I believe that this is a movement and it is not something that is going to radically change corporate structure is not going to radically change overnight the way that humans are are organized or the d- decision making processes they will evolve over time and that i believe that what's happening in with defi is a critical step that will have reverberations will have influence far beyond what we're building here within these financial tools and they will impact other industries as well now you asked a great question which is um decentralization versus recentralization now today the influence of, of uh capital is still critical to the success of an early stage venture so that means if you are building a startup you need somebody that has a high risk tolerance and also has a high um uh, amount of capital we are still at a, a phase of the industry where it where venture capitalists play an incredibly important role and this is um from from two different standpoints from one standpoint that they in many jurisdictions have the uh, authority um to be able to provide capital to early stage uh to early stage uh projects um in in America for example um anyone is allowed to uh start their own business but you're only allowed to uh invest in an early stage uh project if you're considered accredited so that means that probably if you are a builder within the defi ecosystem the first money that's going to come in um that's going to uh, allow any group of builders to to come together are going to be centralized around um institutional investors but at the end of the day it's still a centralized group of investors there's two ways to get around kind of the vc uh centrality one is is that you 
uh, meaning that VCs are the decision makers and that it's eventually the community that becomes the decision makers. Mm -hmm. There's two ways to go about that. One is to ensure that the um, largest token holders are the community, not the VCs. So that can be accomplished in, um, in really one of two ways. It can either be accomplished by, um, by uh, having the majority of the tokens actually given to the community. So that could be in the form of airdrops or, or, um, or farming or other types of, uh, of, um, of uh, token distribution methods. Uh, and then another is to ensure that you have a broad enough distribution of venture capitalists that have uh, backed a project so that there isn't a single group, uh, there isn't a single um, institution of investors that has a strong um, uh, decision-making ability. Uh, meaning if, if the largest investor owns less than 10% and the community as a whole owns over 30%, so then you're going to end up with a distribution where the community actually has a larger sway um, and uh, 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 operates as, uh, as more of an influential business owner, assuming that the community can, um, can uh, uh, come together as, as an independent voice. Um, that's a challenge in of its own. And you also are, uh, are subject to um, financial uh, over, overthrow throughout the life cycle of the project, meaning that if, it's, if a project is a relatively low cap initially, then it still can be just purchased by an independent shareholder, uh, whether that's you know, publicly held or, or, or privately held, mm -hmm. um, and then they can have de facto governance rights. So the... The well, one of the challenges of any anyone or any team that's creating a governance structure within the space and desires to create something that truly is decentralized needs to do two things. One is is that they need to have um, a uh, they need to have a large percentage of the tokens, and I would say uh, a rule of thumb is probably in the thirty percent range. That is. Um, that's that's marked to be distributed to um, a community, um, independent of their uh, their uh, financial status. Meaning that they need to be it needs to be distributed through airdrops. It needs to be distributed through um, uh, through uh, farming distribution methods. There needs to be some type of penalty for large farmers so that whales don't end up with the um, uh, with the majority of the tokens, and this is something that's been uh, um, that's been researched uh, within any of the proof of stake systems. Is that how do you ensure that the early members of proof of stake don't um, become the the controlling factor, and it doesn't it, that proof of stake and or proof of farm, I guess in in the case of most DeFi, um, doesn't become a um, a, a method of uh, centralizing ownership over time. And this is uh, something that is uh, not found particularly within proof of work, which is the consensus mechanism that, um, that uh, Bitcoin and, and at least today Ethereum are built upon because uh, every five years or so, everyone who is mining needs to really throw away their old miners because new mining equipment comes out. So you can't just be grandfathered in um, to own the, the largest amount of tokens and then you just always get the, mo the largest amount of rewards and then that begets the largest amount of tokens, and then it becomes the cycl cyclical process, continuously um, centralizing uh, the you know the the original um, shareholders or or token holders, um, depending upon how the system is broken up. I actually want to um, pick up maybe what is a connecting thread uh, between all of them, and go back to something that's that's maybe a very fundamental concept at the heart of all of it. Uh, which is actually the norm that we are looking to storm here as well. <clears throat> you know, the, the way we've stated it is uh, that human trust can never be replaced by algorithmic trust. Uh, that's of course what we what we're challenging or we're looking to challenge over here. Uh, and, and I'm uh, connecting it back to a couple of words that you use, and I find it really interesting in in all of your work. With, and you mentioned one of them, gamification, but also importantly, entertaining uh, is the other word that you use in in kind of demystifying this world, if you will. And uh, so my, my question fundamentally is this, even if we accept trust can be replaced by algorithmic trust in whatever use case we talk about, is that desirable in the first place? And uh, how do we make it 
desirable if indeed it is desirable well i want to uh i think that you know the the answer to that just kind of butted into our podcast which is um you know i have a uh you know i have a uh i have a 12 year old or actually sorry i have a 13 year old daughter she walked out of the room before she <laughs> yeah that's a big no no um and uh i have a 13 year old daughter um that is uh her lifestyle is predominantly digital you know especially growing up with covid she spent the last two years on school with zoom you know she's interacted with the majority of her friends with a vr headset of the oculus quest uh, on her face or you know her younger brother playing roblox and uh, the um they're 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 so inundated with um with uh flash with glamour um, with uh, bells and whistles, that if you don't create a product that's designed to compete with all of the noise that users um, are uh, exposed to today, then it's very hard to get their attention. And if you don't get their attention, then you can't get their heart. And if you can't get their heart, then you can't build their trust. And then it doesn't matter if the trust is supposed to be defined by math or is supposed to be designed by community. And it's always going to be a combination of the two of those. You know, um, Nike, uh, there was, a, there was a, a lecture that Steve Jobs gave um, about Nike. And I don't want to misquote, but it's, you can find it on YouTube. It's from the late 90s. And, uh, and one of the, some of the takeaways that I learned, because I've watched this and I've, uh, I've watched this you know, many times before this lecture, is that he emphasizes how Nike doesn't make shoes. Nike makes the, um, the glorification and celebration of, of athletes and athletic achievements. And that's what they do as a company. And everything that, that's part of their brand, everything that they, that, they, that they produce, all of their storytelling is focused around that because the product itself is commoditized. And that's what we're seeing in the um, decentralized finance space is that it's very easy to commoditize many of these products, whether it's lending, whether it's trading, um, you know, whether it's insurance, that it doesn't matter what, whether I'm using product A or product B. And even in terms of the rewards that they give me, it might, they might be very similar. And one of the challenges that's happened in DeFi over the last two years is that um, because there's been a lack of focus on user experience or, um, or uh, entertainment or storytelling, that the only thing that people have had to draw them to is the short-term financial rewards, which are distributed usually at a very high amount when a product first launches, and they kind of subsidize your attention through, um, the, uh, through giving away essentially the funds that they received from the venture capitalists um, in one form or another. Um, and then, uh, and then they, um, you know, they, they hope to get a few thousands of users, which is considered good in today's market of, uh, of, of a, a saturated DeFi industry. Um, and then people, went, once the rewards start to, to peter out, uh, the, the, let's call them mercenary DeFi farmers move from one project to the next and never really maintain a sense of community or sense of loyalty. And this is, uh, this is the problem that, uh, that we're trying to solve. And this is really at the, the core of the concept of, uh, of DeFi-tainment, which is that you need to build a, a strong community around a narrative that is, uh, is fun and entertaining and eye-catching and focuses on a, a narrative defined by a user experience. And that if you can do that, you can build a brand and the brand can attract not just thousands of users, not just tens of thousands of users, but millions of users. You know, it feels like <clears throat> there's a spectrum of um, how people approach this entire field. It's either dismissed as being too much hype or it's being um, adopted by people as if this is the uh, you know, this is the thing that will save the world, right? Uh, and it feels like what we need is mass adoption of this, as equally as you know a little bit of tempering of uh, this is not the miraculous cure for everything that ails the world currently. 
Um, so where do you see uh, things unfolding in, in the next few years and uh, and equally going back to drawing parallels with say web one or even the early age of computing uh, is there a danger of us dismissing it too lightly saying this is just glib um, hype or is there also uh, us being blindsided by the fact that in fact this is probably the thing that can uh, that can actually fix a lot of the trust issues that seem to be dividing and polarizing the world more than anything else? That's a, that's a great question. And I'd say that um, <clears throat> at a, I do believe this technology is, is uh, transformative um, and is, is probably the, um, the biggest uh, and will result in the biggest change of wealth um, and wealth drivers that humanity has ever seen. You know, this is, uh, we will look back at the uh, the Bitcoin white paper, and then subsequently everything that's come of it, um, as important as the invention of the steam engine or the light bulb, uh, or you know the maybe even the combustion engine or radio, ra- you know radio waves or the invention of penicillin. I believe it will be on that list, and I think that um, <clears throat> if you um, if you kind of uh, roll your your eyes at that, then uh, I think it's. Um, it's because of the permissionless nature. And, uh, you know, well, when you have permissionless, um, that means that you have no censorship. Now, censorship um, can be um, viewed, censorship is 99% of the time a good thing. Whenever you create a, a, a technology which is designed to be censorship resistant, um, and that's part of its uh, value driver, like public blockchains. You know, nobody can turn off Bitcoin. You know, the the Chinese government um, attempted the, the Chinese government. How many times did it take them to block Facebook? Once. How many times did it take them to block Disney? Once. How many times have they tried to block Bitcoin? Hundreds of times. It's like every month or every like three weeks they block Bitcoin again. Why is it that they need to keep blocking Bitcoin? Because it's really hard to block Bitcoin. Um, so it's as a technology, it's censorship resistant. Now, when something is censorship resistant, it means that you're going to end up with, again, 99% of it is going to be um, is going to reflect the evils that are just naturally found within humanity. It's going to be the scammers. It's going to be the ransomers. It's going to be the illicit work. And and I don't think that the solution to that is uh, is necessarily going to be found within uh, government oversight. Um, I, I, but I do believe that that they, that we will have um, uh, self-regulated uh, communities that will be able to, um, on a global scale, uh, perform the type of filtering um, the same way that the government doesn't need to filter my email. I choose an email provider that and that has the right level of filtering that I want. If I wanted, you know, so like certain types of. Um, you know, of, uh, of, of negativity in the world to be able to be uh, accessible through my email. Um, that's, that's my choice as a, as, as a free thinking person to be able to do that. But, you know, most people can say, you know what, I really don't want the, you know, that, that type of information and I want it to be blocked. So, <clears throat> so I think that, um, that why most people um, still have still struggle with the value drivers found within crypto is because of that is because they hear um, only about the bad use cases and uh, but I think that over time that that will become uh, less and less of an issue uh, and I think that we've even seen it today of less and less of an issue through consumer um, education through um, you know, through uh, like through through wallets, through the endpoints getting better. That now, uh, you know, an endpoint. If somebody sends me some like clearly scam coin, it doesn't show up by default in my wallet. I have no way of even seeing it on most common wallets, and that's because it's almost like a, a spam filter. And now I have control of whether or not I want to turn that off or turn that on, whether or not I want to be influenced by you know by by the, these like random things that might have been airdropped to me. Um, that's a, that answers kind of part of the, the question as to why somebody would blow off uh, crypto. And that's why I believe that, um, that, there's, that, that there's no going back. We're, we've already opened, you know, the, 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 we've already opened the gates and blockchain powered, blockchain um, powering crypto is here to stay. And it's, it's the most transformative thing that happened, you know, since, you know, that since we figured out how to, you know, 
to how to how to make electricity in the first place. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. This has just been such an enlightening uh, session for us. Um, since the time uh, we started thinking about this norm and we were putting together our own thoughts, uh, it's it's just been a roller coaster for us. And I think you closed many loops for us in in that way, you know, with your with your examples and with your practical experience. Because what we were looking up and what we were reading was still a lot of what is written on the internet, and that's what was our source. But here you come with real experience and live cases, and you tell us that it is here to stay, and uh, it is the future. It's as big as you know the invention of steam engine, or even bigger, and uh, we better look forward to it and find ways of embracing it rather than trying to evade it and say no it's got these 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 gaps and it's 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 probably you know needs many things to be fixed before that becomes a reality i think what you're telling us is it is upon us it is here and now we need to find ways and means of making it work for us you know that absolutely and and i think that uh I think you just summarized it so well for us, Jonathan. Thank you so much. This is going to be a very, very useful session for many of our listeners here in India and across the world. And we're really, really grateful that you could find time to do this. Well, thank you. It was a lot of fun and I'm happy to speak anytime. So, Narayan, what did you take away from everything that Jonathan said? Anisha, one of my favorite memes is this picture of a seagull sitting on a beachside sign that says, no seagulls. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the best metaphor for a core tenant of the communications business for me, that it is not enough to merely put information in front of people. Unless you engage and entertain them, they will ignore the information, either as irrelevant or complex. So Jonathan's approach to G5 or the whole realm of Web3 itself, that education without entertainment is useless, really appealed to me. But that's just one of the many insightful things he said. What about you, Anisha? How would you storm this norm? What hacks do you have for our audience? Thanks to technology, trust has become the central pivot for any brand choice. And I just want to go straight back to our norm. Can Mm. trust, human trust, be replaced by machine trust? Customers have more choice than ever before. And conversely, choosing a product or service has become a lot more challenging and time-consuming, as you had said right up front in the beginning. Mm. What buyers really want is a shorthand, something to make those decisions faster and easier. That's where the importance of brand trust comes in. Indeed, Anisha, and COVID-19 has significantly accelerated the appetite for trustworthy brands. I mean, even before the pandemic, conditions were ripe for all-round reassessment of consumer values. But data mining by mobile apps and social networks, the advent of fake news, and a growing spate of cybersecurity breaches all converged in a way that made trust and transparency more elusive than ever, and therefore more desirable. Spot on, Narayan. And in that context, uh, algorithmic trust will play a significant role backed by blockchain. So what I have today are not so much hacks as my take on what could be blockchain's levers of trust. Mm. The first one really is because here, this is about trust in a ledger as against trust in a identity. Mm. The earlier trust is all about human trust and that human is an identity. It's an individual, Mm. it's an identity. So while trust at an individual level is based on identity and individual experience, Trust in an institution, organization, or collective is based on a centralized entity with the same collective identity. But at the core of all of it is either the individual identity or a collective identity. Mm. But the default use of blockchain is to generate trust in a distributed ledger Mm. where there are no verifiable identities. Mm. The identities of any party transacting on the network are generally unknowable and therefore untrustworthy within the network itself, since that kind of trust has to be established outside of the network. Mm -hmm. So blockchain ensures that secured, decentralized, encrypted identities present the verified identifier in the form of a QR code to prove their identity to access any service. 
So the service provider verifies the identity by verifying the proof of control or ownership of the presented attestation. It's more like there is a QR code and mm. you scan a QR code and that's when you get verified. But minus that QR code, there is no identity. Okay, let me see if I can infuse some of that entertainment logic here. So to bring <laughs> back the analogy of Rashomon, what you're saying is that with blockchain, the samurai, his wife, the woodcutter and the bandit would all have the same exact version of the story because it's not their perspective, but a singular story verified by multiple witnesses that they access regardless of their own perspectives or beliefs. Absolutely. And this is where the analogy just fits in so beautifully. Hmm. Now imagine the trust in any service or experience backed not by an individual, but the data backed by a ledger with billions of such secure identities. Can you elaborate on this with a use case? So let's take a use case where trust is of utmost importance, voting during elections. Mm. When it comes to voting, the widespread public mistrust of online voting could be addressed to eliminate voter fraud and obviate the needs for recounts. Mm. No more stuffed ballot boxes or stolen elections. That makes so much sense, Anisha. What's the second level you want to talk about? Trust through transfer of data ownership in the hands of consumers. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that users will be in full control of their data by the end of the next decade. Separating data from applications will be the biggest, biggest advantage of blockchain. Mm -hmm. We all know the importance of data in customer management and its direct correlation with brand trust. Mm -hmm. In the modern era of big data, businesses have come to see data as their fiefdom with full control to manipulate and navigate to their advantage, despite all the data regulations and, and, and whatever is available in the form of policy. Yeah. In the current ecosystem, our data is owned by too many different service providers, banks, e-commerce stores, brick and mortar retailers, and just name it. All our data is all over the place. Mm. This means our information is stored in potentially thousands of different databases who have the right to do as they please with it, laws notwithstanding. Yeah. But to do that in an era where consumers' appetite for trust and transparency is only increasing by the day, it is imperative for businesses to rethink the click and control model of data ownership in order to build a trustworthy brand that can leverage the decentralization for which blockchain is known. Companies that treat data as proprietary must therefore undergo a cultural change from being closed to being open and from being driven by private gain to being driven by public good. Without that, blockchain initiatives will fail even before they've begun. 100% with you on that, Anisha. So what's the use case of the consumer advantages of this data ownership? Well, the first one that really comes to my mind is something that I do every time is my own curated shopping list, irrespective of where I shop from. I decided to create, you know, a 70 item list on mm. Big Basket, uh, which is my monthly grocery list. I decide to move to another platform I have to start and create my own list all over again. Why can't I just carry my list from one platform to the other? You know, I'm listening to a set of podcasts uh, on, on a channel and that I have a list, which is my own list. But I, if I shift from one platform to another, I have to mm -hmm. go about creating that same list all over again. I mean, controlling, having the control of my data, irrespective of its application and platform, is something that is mine. I have created it. So it should belong to me. You know, that's such a great elaboration of the point you made at the beginning of this of this uh, second lever, which is separate data from application, right? And give the ownership to, to the consumers. That's such a great lever of trust. All right. What's the third? Uh, mm. It's important that, you know, we build trust through transparency and traceability. Mm. Consumers are losing faith in brands that are opaque and non-transparent. And when your customers don't trust you, they start looking for brands they can. But it's possible to win back your, your place in consumers' heart with the use of transparency and traceability possible only through blockchain. Mm. Today, the only information that customers have is the information companies give to them. Yeah. Imagine the power of a brand that is in a position to make visible every aspect of their business right from sourcing to supply, the authenticity of the raw material, 
the origin of parts, the use of labor, the impact of that on society. You can scan it all the way on your phone and see the entire history. Is it real? Is it organic? Is it sustainable? Which country is it coming from? The promise of greater transparency, you know, years, a couple of years back prompted Coca-Cola to use blockchain in order to manage the issue of forced labor. Mm. Unilever, a few years back, piloted uh, to build a database of small tea producers in Malawi to improve supply chain transparency. Absolutely. I mean, again, this seems so obvious, but still not enough companies and businesses are adopting this, it sounds like. So let's take stock of what we've got so far. Uh, so distribute trust using a ledger versus building it based on identity. Mm -hmm. Transfer ownership to consumers to build trust. And the third, build trust through enabling transparency. What else have you got, Anisha? The fourth one is equally powerful. Trust by avoidance of disintermediation. Mm. The whole dominance of intermediaries in any value chain means if any one intermediary breaks the trust of the customer or has disproportionate influence on the value chain, then it weakens the whole chain and puts trust at risk. Yeah. The distributed trust model overcomes the key problems with intermediaries. Mm. In this system, enabled by the blockchain, trustworthiness is independent of any single one of the participants. In fact, the system continues to work even when everyone actively distrusts each other. <laughs> Absolutely, Anisha. <laughs> so what's your fifth and final lever? The last one is a little controversial. Okay. Uh, still not uh, fully in place though. Hmm. But it is, blockchain is incomplete without it. Trust through a secure reward mechanism. Okay, I'm intrigued by this. Ask the average person on the street what they think of when they hear blockchain and they'll likely say cryptocurrency. They might also add controversy, crash, volatility, risk. Yeah. If they've heard anything about the initial exaggerated hype around Bitcoin yeah. or the roller coaster rides that investors in cryptocurrencies were then taken on as a result. Yeah. So in the public imagination, blockchain and high-risk cryptocurrencies that tanked may be more or less synonymous. Yeah. It's hard not to be struck by the irony that a technology whose primary focus is the management of trust could have ended up being the object of so much mistrust. So blockchain's reputation then precedes it. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, though, that this reputation is false. Okay. The reward mechanism of blockchain, if regulated well, can indeed become its biggest strength and source of trust. Well-regulated, well-governed, decentralized reward mechanisms away from intermediaries are a must in truly leveraging the full potential of blockchain. You know, Anisha, every single one of these levers of trust that you speak about, because it is so intricately interwoven with, with blockchain, it you know, takes me back to the days of uh, early computing or even the early days of the internet, uh, mm -hmm. Web1 as we call it now, you know, where the likes of Xerox Corporation or even IBM, uh, the leaders of those companies back then said, I cannot imagine a reason or a day why anybody would need a personal computer in their homes. And I have a feeling we're, we have a lot of people similarly scoffing at the, the hype around blockchain right now. But, um, you know, maybe the among the things to include in what history will be kind of, kinder to alongside our former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh is probably blockchain because mm -hmm. it is the future. Uh, and I think the sooner we uh, understand its potential, its power and adopt it, maybe the better it is. Uh, but absolutely insightful takes on each of those levers of, of, uh, of trust. Uh, and there's a lot of usable insights in one place, if I may say so. And if there's one thing I would reinforce from listening to all of it, it is this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep the end goal of trust in sight at all times to enable human decisions that consistently and reliably, reliably meet expectations. Because what blockchain can enable is take out the kinks and human-induced inconsistencies in building and distributing trust. Well put, Narayan. So I think this is a good place to also get our GT expert, Kalpana Balasubramanian, CEO of Digital. 
which is GT Bharat's digital transformation arm, to weigh in on how businesses can use the levers of blockchain to transform trust building internally and externally. Kalpana, thank you so much for being here on Storm the Norm. And uh, you know, one of the reasons we love to have a guest expert from GT Bharat is because of the, if I may use a very simplistic word, the extreme usability of the advice that we get from the GT expert over here. And that's what we're looking from you as well over here today. And what we want to hear from you is how can businesses use the levers of blockchain to transform trust building both internally and externally? Right. So so if you look at uh, blockchain as a technology, right, um, essentially it can allow you to trace the entire supply chain. So for example, if you look at transformation and you look at the recent COVID supply chain debacle, I would think that, you know, that had companies implemented blockchain much earlier, they would have actually known their, you know, let's say their um, points where they are vulnerable and therefore, you know, manage that better. And and as probably, you know, citizens who are wanting to do the right thing, say, for example, even in sustainability, you could actually trace, for example, is uh, is material being procured fairly, uh, you know, are we destroying forests in the process, uh, what really is happening over there. So, so in my view, you know, it's a technology that can be used for a couple of things. Of course, you know, getting rid of maybe financial intermediaries, I mean, the popular one that you would have uh, heard and traded uh, and so on. But uh, of course, supply chain is one, and um, it could even be used for co co causes like, let's say, uh, you know, waste management. Uh, so let's look at reusing, uh, you know, maybe plastic or reusability, uh, recycling, and so on and so forth. So, so the application has no bounds. So, Kalpana, what could make it go wrong, or what could make it fail? Well, in anything, uh, including probably, you know. The David and Goliath story: the strength is always the weakness. Uh, so, if you if you look at blockchain, one of the biggest problems could be you know misuse because of anonymity. Uh, I mean, you would have several million dollars siphoned and you wouldn't know. The second thing is it's a record that is for eternity, and therefore, if for example, you know, to borrow from probably some of the views of larger, uh, you know, colleges and institutes. Um, if you want to mute something, there is, it is not possible. It is immutable. And therefore, you know, you, once you create that record, then it's there forever. Of course, the last thing is it does consume a lot of energy. And therefore, if you are a sustainability activist, how do you actually, you know, uh, validate the amount of energy you're going to consume because every time you record something it's it's going to be distributed and therefore you know there's requirement of lot more of infra um, because of the whole distribution and and so on so in my mind you know whatever is the strength of the technology is normally the weak link as well and if we go back and look at any others it would be the same and this is no different so th thank you once again for that, Karthana. I think it was really insightful. And, and I'm conscious that, you know, you made such a valid point about the people who will take this forward will see themselves as perpetuators and not perpetrators of uh, leveraging the advantage of this technology because, uh, because of the cyclical effect that you spoke about between the cost and the benefits. Uh, I think we need to be mindful of whether uh, we're turning this into a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle and hopefully we will uh, come out on the virtuous side of things. A fascinating norm, a vast canvas in which it feels like we're all still novices but excited explorers too, an incisive expert and some great levers to apply algorithmic trust in the real world. That's a lot to whet anyone's appetite I think Anisha. Yes, and also a good place to wrap up episode 27 of Storm the Norm. As always, there are multiple places you can catch us on. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, GeoSavan, by just searching for Storm the Norm. And on Sare Gamapa, Karavan, 2.0 devices on channel 453. This is Narayan. And Anisha. 
signing off for now. We'll be back with a new episode shortly. Thank you and talk to you soon. Thank you.